this morning. We're going to continue talking about outreach. And uh, I don't know how much longer we're going to go with this, probably till we're done. Holy Spirit says we've talked about what we need to talk about. But outreach is, again, just kind of a preface, one of these topics in the church that gets talked about fairly regularly. I would even say that the modern North American church has made outreach their top priority. The problem with it being the top priority is that what should be at the top priority, which is relationship with God, is not. And here's a little tidbit about how priorities work. When you have a higher priority and a lower priority, and you've got priorities underneath that, your highest priority will shift how you accomplish every priority that falls underneath it. And so if your highest priority isn't to live for God and, and to walk in obedience and to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, but instead your highest priority is to just go out and tell people what you think is the gospel, what's going to happen is that priority will trump living right, and eventually you'll stop actually telling people about God, and you'll just be building your own little kingdom. You'll feel like you're doing God's work. You'll feel like you're doing things. You'll, you'll be doing outreaches. You'll be doing stuff and, and it won't have any fruit because your priorities are off kilter. So when we talk about outreach, it's, it's always important to remember what our purpose is. And it goes right back to identity. I know I talked about this on our first one, but I'm going to give you guys a reminder. When we break down identity, we break it down into three major sections. Do you guys remember what they are? First one is value. God establishes our value. Secondly, it's purpose. What's our purpose? You guys remember? This is so important because it's for every single believer. Our purpose, I want you, whenever, we're going to do this because it seems like people forget this pretty quickly. When I say purpose, I want you to think of a stack of bread. Okay? The reason I want you to think of a stack of bread is because the word purpose in the New Testament means the 12 loaves of bread or is in reference to the 12 loaves of bread that you find in the Old Testament that were in the, sorry, in the temple. And the 12 loaves of bread represented what? The 12 tribes of God, of Israel. And so what was the purpose of that bread? That was God's representation of his people to the world. So when we think of the bread, I want you to remember our purpose is to represent God to the world. That's not in just going out and talking about him. A good representation of God is to live godly. A good representation of God is to prioritize what God wants over what man wants. And then the third part, so we've got number one is value. Number two is purpose. And number three is authority. And it's in authority that we find outreach. Remember we pointed it out in the first one? The value was God reaching to us. The purpose was God also outreaching to us. He was giving us the purpose. Now the authority is God giving us the ability to reach the world because we've been reached. And you need to go through it about this way because if you start going after your own purpose or you start acting in your own authority, without having first figured out your purpose, your authority will start to determine your purpose. And from that, you start to determine your own value. And all of a sudden, the order gets out of order. And this is how people end up walking away from God because we get things out of place. We need to remember we live for him first. And then we walk the way he wants us to walk as far as authority goes. If you watch the disciples' journey, what did he do with the disciples? He started working on their character long before he sent them out. As a matter of fact, Jesus died on the cross and rose again and gave them one final instruction, which was to go and wait in the upper room for the Holy Spirit before they started their full ministry. Everything up until that point was training. They walked with Jesus. They talked with Jesus. They understood his teachings. Jesus opened his heart and taught them everything he knew so that when the time came that they were to go out, they were fully equipped to do so. But Jesus didn't start with outreach. He started with discipleship. 
This is why when Jesus talks to the disciples and tells them to go out into all of the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, what he's doing, he didn't say go out and make converts. He didn't say go out and teach the gospel. He, he said go out and make what? Disciples. There's a big difference here because disciples are learned ones. They're ones who continuously learn. We've taken that to mean go out and preach the gospel because there's other Bible verses that talk about it. But Jesus said go make disciples. Go make learners. Learners are people who are on, on, hanging on every word, trying to say, God, if this is who you say I can be, how do I get there? If you say I can be a child of God, how do I walk there? If you're telling me Jesus died on the cross for my sins so that I no longer have to fear hell, death, and the grave, how do I accept this gift? And that's what the, that's what the apostles taught was that lifestyle. So, with that in mind, we're going to get into being a witness. So, We've talked about how outreach is divided up into two major categories and everything kind of just trickles down from that. So you've got witness and you've got evangelist. Okay? The evangelist can do the work of a witness, but a witness cannot do the work of an evangelist. Here's why. And I'm not going to talk too much about evangelists today because we're focusing really in on the witness, but an evangelist is a, is a titled position of authority in the kingdom of God. And not everybody's allowed to hold this position. Not everybody's allowed to even act in this position. Why? Because it's a position of authority. But a witness, if you are a Christian... Not only is witnessing part of what you're so, not some part of what you can do, it's something you're called to. And if you don't do it, Jesus would consider that useless. And we'll look at some of that in a little bit. But everybody is called to be a witness. Not everybody's called to be an evangelist. And, and, and for some reason in this culture, we've gotten so self-centered and so focused inwardly that we all want to have this position and this title. We all want this fame. We all want to be the one at the top. We all want to be the one saying something. And, and, and I don't understand where this comes from because the, Jesus said that the greatest of you on earth, will be, or in, on earth will be the least of you in heaven, but the least of you on earth will be the greatest in heaven. What does that mean? He says, it's not about me. And then if you go and you read, uh, I think it's in Corinthians, when, when he's, or in Romans, it was in Romans, when Jesus is talking about love. Or not Jesus, Paul is talking about love, and he talks about how it's patient, it's kind, it bears all things, it loves, it hopes all things. It does. He gives this huge description about love, and what's he talking about? He's talking about people walking in their gifts. When you walk in your gifts, this is how you do it. And one of the things in there is not focused inwardly. Too Often, we want the gifts and power of God to glorify me rather than him. And that's not a good witness. That's not even good. Of, that, that, that's completely opposite. If, you're an ev- if you see an evangelist doing this, run. Because as an evangelist, you, you are in a certain level of authority. And when you're in that level of authority, there's a higher level of accountability. Not everybody gets to sit in that level of authority. But everybody's called to witness. So let's talk about, we're going to look at a couple of instances. I'm going to look at two major instances in scripture where we see a witness at work. Okay, We're going to see what, what is a witness, how does it work, why did God call us to do this. So we're going to break it down for you. And if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to go there. We're going to start at John chapter 4. And we're going to go from 7 all the way to 45. We're going to get some word today. So... Uh, It's important to uh, bring your Bibles if you want to follow along with me this way. If not, we have that for your convenience. So John chapter 4, and we're going to start at verse 7. If you've got got your Bible handy, you'll see the little title. It says, The Woman of Samaria. This is important, and we're going to look at at her story real quick. There's also this story in Mark if you want to see it from a slightly different perspective, but I liked the one in John a little bit better. So a woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Now, before I keep going, 
Samaria was a separation of, of uh, Jewish culture. So they were still Jews, but they were separate from, from Israel in, in that they were technically not talking to each other. They were, they were, in some cases, forbidden to talk to each other. And so what happened is the fact that Jesus is having this discussion with a Samaritan woman in and of itself is something that was unheard of. It was something that was considered not okay in that culture, okay? So preface that, this conversation with this. So a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus saw her, said to her, come give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away to the city to buy food. So the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it th- that you, though you are a Jew, are asking me for a drink? Though I am a Samaritan woman, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus replied to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And so she said, Sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. How then do you intend to get this living water? Now, I find this to be the case with many, many people. You start talking about God. You start talking about what he's done for you. And they're immediately going to go to the practical things of the world. So you're telling me if I forgive my enemy, God's going to forgive me? When when, when I don't hold a grudge towards someone, my life will get better? It's instinctually wrong to the flesh, but it's true to the spirit. And this is what Jesus is talking about. He's speaking from a spiritual perspective, whereas she's still focused fleshly. She said to him, sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. How then do you get this living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob and you who gave us the well and who drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle. So what's he saying? You're not greater than Jacob. How can you do this? Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never be thirsty. But the water that I give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to eternal life. I, we could dissect this, but for the purposes of today, we're not going to. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty, nor come all the way out here to draw water. She's still thinking in terms of the physical. She's still thinking, wait a minute, you've got water that makes me never thirsty again? I don't have to walk all the way to this well every single day. And yet Jesus keeps persisting. We'll go to verse 13. Or verse 16, sorry. But he said to her, go and call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said to him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have correctly said I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This which you have said is true. I find it fascinating that even though this Samaritan woman is in adultery, Jesus valued the truth that she said. He points out that she just did, she didn't lie to him. I, I, I honestly find this so important because when we're talking about being a witness we need to make sure that we value truth the way God values truth lest we become a false witness we'll keep reading the woman said to him sir I perceive that you are a prophet so she's starting to get the picture a little bit she's getting closer and closer to what's actually happening our fathers worshipped on this mountain and yet you Jews you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where we must worship. And Jesus said to her, believe me, woman, that a time is coming when you will worship the father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. But a time is coming and even now has arrived when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and in truth. For such, play, for such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I am he, the one speaking to you. 
So Jesus is coming in and rocking this, this lady's world, okay? She knows the Messiah is coming. She knows that this Messiah is going to have the answers. She knows that he's going he's gonna to be sent from God to rescue everybody. And so she doesn't even recognize him at first, but Jesus leads her down this path so that at first he recognizes her. Or she recognizes him. She comes to recognize him as who? The Messiah, whereas before he was just a Jew. She is looking to him and had expectantly been waiting for a Messiah to come. She had been expectantly waiting for the answer to every question she was looking for. And as soon as that answer presented himself, her heart shifted and she received. At this point, his disciples came and they were amazed that he had been speaking with a woman, yet no one said, what are you seeking or why are you speaking with her? So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the people, come and see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is he? They left the city and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him saying, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? His disciples are again focused on what? The natural way of things. And Jesus is focused on what? The supernatural. I'm going to pause here for a moment because I want to point some things out when it comes to outreach. When we want to witness to the world, we need to be careful that we're not focused on fulfilling the natural things of the world because the world can do that. We need to be focused on fulfilling the supernatural things that people desire. The answer we have isn't a new coat. It's not food to eat. It's not, it's not a full belly. It's not a warm home, although those things can be part of it. What we have to offer is of supernatural value. We have on the inside of us bread and water because who's on the inside of us? Christ. And so when we have something to give that is so valuable in terms of eternity, why do we continuously focus back onto the flesh? The Samaritan woman whose eyes were only for the flesh, Jesus shifted to the spirit. The disciples came back whose eyes were on the flesh, Jesus shifted to the Spirit. And yet as the church today, for some reason, we've taken our eyes off of what's important, which is eternity, which is salvation, which is that which lives within me has died for you so you can come into Christ. Instead, we focused back onto the things of the flesh, just like the disciples did, just like that Samaritan woman did. And we've cared more about filling bellies and clothing people than we have about telling them about Jesus. I grew up in a bit of a word of a faith, a word of faith background, and I often heard testimonies that people loved to hear. Well, God gave me this house. God gave me this car. God gave me this. God gave me that. And those were the testimonies that people sought after. And you know what that did is that created in people a hunger for God to fulfill the fleshly desires of our lives. But I want you to note something. Jesus started spiritual and he ends spiritual. We're going to keep reading through this. And I want you to hear her testimony. It's not about how he fulfilled her fleshly desires, but how he fulfilled her spiritual desires. Not just desires, but needs. Without Christ, we're dead. If you'd have a seed, you plant it in the ground and you never water it, that seed dies. And yet... What we want to do is we want to put everything on that seed other than the water of Christ to the point where there are actually churches in town going out and doing ministry but refusing to tell people about Jesus because, because Jesus had no strings attached, which is also a lie. It's a false form of ministry because the eyes are now focused on what's physical rather than what's really important, which is what? Spiritual. Spiritual. Jesus wouldn't have set up, uh, this is going to sound a little bit off, but Jesus wouldn't have set up these, these uh, safe use zones that the culture has now set off. He would have looked at them and said, you need what I have, which is living water. 
And so, you know, what we churches do, well, come on in, we're going to put you through this 12-step program rather than saying, wait a minute, what you need is living water. What you need is Christ in you. And when you have Christ in you, everything else starts to die away as you start to walk in obedience. Like Annie talked about this morning, God cuts away that which is no longer part of who you should be. And you know what happens when you prune? When you get rid of all the branches that should not be there, fruit starts to grow on the branches that should be there. If you know anything about farming, if you take a fruit tree and there's, or, or yeah, farming trees, if you take a fruit tree and there's too many branches, the fruit only grows so big and never gets to its full potential because there's too much weight and not enough room for the fruit to grow. So what they do is they prune it down to what looks almost like nothing. It looks ugly, it looks hideous, but eventually when it comes time for it to bear fruit, it bears huge, juicy, fruitful fruit that everybody wants to partake of. And I think that's just like Christ. When you prune down a tree, it goes from this beautiful green tree to something that's not really attractive. But what becomes attractive about it is what comes later. You see, we want to look good to the world. And God says, wait a minute, when I'm pruning you, you won't look good to the world until they see your fruit. But what we want, we want to look good. We want to be that tree with all the flowers, with all the, with all the branches, with all the leaves, with everything. We want to look so fancy-dancy. I got my life together. Look at me. Everything's good. I got this. I got that. We look like this big crazy tree, and yet our fruit is small and fruitless. But when we let God cut us back, when, he, when we let God say, you know what, I'm going to take this part of you away, I'm going to take this part of you away, how many of us have found our identity in things like money? And things like possessions and things like what, what people see of us, what car we drive, what furniture we have, how big our house is, how small our house is, the size of our RV, whatever it is. There's so many, not, not like it's bad to have all of those things, but when that becomes the showpiece, the fruit is small. But when we start to cut away all the little things that God says don't matter in this world, you can't take any of it with you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust and flame cannot affect it. Let's keep reading. So the disciple, I'm going to do with verse 33 again. So the disciples were saying to one another, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? So Jesus said to them, verse 34, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me and to accomplish his work. Whoa. Who are we supposed to be like? Jesus. And what food is he talking about that satisfies him? The work of God. The work of God. You know why we have so many spiritually skinny Christians? Because they don't work. They don't work for God. And so you know what? They don't have the nourishment required. What is Jesus saying? If you want to walk the way we want you to walk, you have to work the way God wants you to work. That's his food. Now, how different would it be if we looked at our relationship with God this way? Rather than I'm going to come to God and he's going to give me everything, but rather my working for his will is the food I consume. What does that mean? It means that when I'm working for God, I get the fulfillment my spirit longs for. When God becomes my priority... When, 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 when my obedience to God breaks every social norm out there, when my obedience to God makes no sense to anyone else, I'll be fulfilled because I'm doing the work of God, which is food. <laughs> this actually makes, if, if, you've, if you've read the, the story of how Jesus said, take this bread, break it, that was the work of God being done. That's why it's food. Jesus dying was the work of the Father. It was the obedience to the Father, which is the work, which is why when we serve God, when we start doing that, when we take up our cross like Jesus did, what are we doing? We're doing it so that we're doing the work of God. That's what fulfills us. We're going to keep going. Verse 35, do not say there... 
Or do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I tell you, rise your eyes and observe the fields. They are white for the harvest. Now, so many Christians today look at that and say, you know what? That's still true today. We have this, we have that. But let me explain something to you for a moment. What did Jesus start with? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. He's telling you to be looking around because not every field is ripe for the harvest. Well, Jeremiah, that's heresy. No, it's not. Because when Jesus sent out the disciples, they sometimes came to a town that didn't receive them. What did Jesus tell his disciples to do when they came to a town that didn't receive them? He said to wipe your feet and to take your peace with you and leave them. Why is that? Because that town was not ripe for the harvest. But that means that there are going to be people we need to stop investing in. And there's going to be people we need to heavily invest in. Because there's a certain level of wisdom and knowledge and understanding that comes through relationship with God. That we can start to recognize those that are hungry and those that are not. This is good stuff. Verse 36, Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life so that, one, so that the one who sows and the one who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case, the saying is true. One sows and another reaps. I have sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have come into their labor. Now, <laughs> this is this is so important. What does that even mean? The here, here's what happened. They were waiting for a savior. That means everything was ripe, so that the moment the savior came, the harvest could be reached. They came with an answer. They were all everybody else was waiting for. You see, in a culture like today, we don't have a culture that's ready. We don't have a culture saying, I want the Savior. I'm waiting for the Savior. What do we have a culture that says, I'm the Savior? And so you know what we need to do is we need to start planting seeds so that somewhere down the line somebody can say, that, that Savior you're looking for, his name is Jesus. Now there will be people out there who are looking for that, but if they're not ready for it, they won't receive from you. And we can't be offended at that. Jesus taught to thousands and thousands of people, and of all the people he taught, 14 were with him through his whole ministry. That's it. 14 men followed him from start to finish. Does that sound like a lot of people to you? Some came, some went, some came partway through, but only 14 were with him all the way through. And so you know what happens is, God, is Jesus invested in those who were there? And the 14 were rewarded. Only one of the 14 got chosen. One of the two that had followed him throughout the whole thing got chosen. And the other guy just got to experience walking with Jesus, which in and of itself would be a huge blessing. But we need to remember this when we're doing our witnessing because sometimes we get overzealous and we try chopping something that's not ready to be chopped. We corner people into, you need to tell this about Jesus, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this, and they're not ready, and so they'll say something to shut you up, and then they walk away. Remember what our witness is about. Remember how Jesus did ministry. He never forced anybody. He never guilt-tripped anybody. He looked at them and said, well, if you want to follow me, this is what you do, and he walked away. Are, do, are we able to do that? We like to goad people into doing stuff. We like to pressure them in because that's how we've been taught to sell in this country. But here's what we do. When we have the truth, this is what light does, okay? If you take a dark room, there is nowhere you can point that light that's not going to expose what's hidden. Unless you hide it under something. But when you expose which is the word, what the word does, when you expose, you are positioning people with a need to respond because once their sin becomes apparent, they have a choice to make. Will I continue in it or will I repent and change? Our job is not to force change. It's to simply witness. We'll get to that part later. 
So John 38, uh, I'm going to keep reading. Now 39. Now from that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all the things that I have done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them. And he stayed there two more days. Many more believed because of his word. And they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves and we know that this one truly is the savior of the world. And after two days, he departed there from, or from there for Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him only because they had seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they themselves also went to the feast. Now I want to point out some really important things. Verse, verse 39. Now from this city, many, or from that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all things that I have done. Is this evangelism? Or is this witness? This is what we consider witnessing. Why? She's not a teacher of the word. She doesn't understand the word. At this point, the Samaritan woman doesn't know the word. So what was she doing? She was witnessing. What was she witnessing to? The power of God. She was witnessing to what Jesus had said. This is so important because we think all the time, and, and there are some that are going to be some that sow, that some that water, some that harvest. But what she did is she said, guys, look at what Jesus did in my life. And some believed her because of what Jesus did in her. She didn't go out and tell the gospel message. She didn't talk about the beginning in, in Genesis. She didn't talk about King David. She didn't talk about the prophet Isaiah, the prophet Jeremiah, the prophet Ezekiel, the prophet Elijah. She didn't talk about any of these guys who were, who were talking about how to live. She went out and said, look at what Jesus did for me. And she didn't just go and be like, come here, let me tell you about this. She proclaimed it through the streets and some came. Now I want you to go down a little bit. Go to verse 42. And then, and then they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know this one truly is the Savior of the world. What Jesus did was evangelism. Jesus had the authority to teach, to train, to forgive, to do all of those things. What she did was witness. This is the difference. The witness goes out and says, come, let me, let's tell you about what Jesus did. And then the evangelists teach and train. This is why the evangelists were what? what what's, their, what's their purpose in the church? Same with apostles, prophets, teachers. It's to equip the saints. What did Jesus do? What was his whole ministry about? He equipped his people to go out and do what? Tell the world about how the kingdom of God works on this planet. This is a really beautiful example of witnessing because so many of us want to be evangelists and yet none of us, most of us are not equipped for it. You cannot be an evangelist if you cannot teach the gospel through and through and walk in authority that God gave you to. As a matter of fact, the actual, as far as the disciples went, they were all men. Why is that? Because authority over people was given to man. We're going to get into this, uh, into, into women in ministry in a little bit. I don't know when we're going to do it, but I think it's so important in this church today. Not just, the, not this church, but the church of Christ. Because we all have roles to play. What happens if in a home, the wife decides, I want to be the head of the home instead of the father? What happens? Chaos, a reverse of order, things come out of place, the relationship starts to die, and you know what happens, and this, is, this is, happens over and over again, when the wife oversteps the boundaries that God has given her in the family, God no longer takes priority in that family over time. Because as you continue to feed sin, that becomes the father under which you become a, having authority. Whereas when you put yourself in a position of humility to God, what happens? God starts to become the authority in your life. And this is where you start to see fruit. It's the same thing when it comes to witnessing and evangelism. Not every guy is going to be called to, to evangelism. We had a guy, when we first started our church, come and tell me, Jeremiah, I'm an evangelist. I go out and I do street ministry and I do this and I do this. And this guy was out there. But he wasn't an evangelist. 
He didn't understand the word of God. He had no authority to enact anything on the word of God. He couldn't kick people out of the church. He couldn't equip and train and teach and reproof and help people grow. He, d- he didn't have one of the fivefold ministry callings. So what was he? A witness. And because he didn't have it right, you could have called him a false witness. I'm stepping on a lot of toes today. <laughs> But there's, there's, God is a God of order and, and justice. And, and it, it's not to sound legalistic, but here's the beautiful part. A witness submitted to the will of Christ will affect way more people with far more power than somebody who thinks they're an evangelist and goes out without the will of Christ. This woman in adultery, a sinner, encounter Jesus who prophesied over her, went out and witnessed to the world. And a whole wackadoo of Samaritans came to hear Jesus speak. That's powerful. And you know what? God will reward her for that. But she didn't go out thinking, oh, I met the Messiah. Now I can be an evangelist. No. No. Jesus said, or Paul said, and Peter said, do not put a novice in ministry because they will get puffed up. They'll get prideful. They'll get torn down and they won't work, which you see today. How many churches are closing in Madison Hat? Because pastors can't get their stuff together. Not just Medicine Hat. I, I think it was like, oh, I'm going to butcher the stats. I think it was like one in three in North America over the last five years have closed their doors. One in three. And we like to think, oh, it's because the people aren't supporting the pastor. Oh, it's because you're not, you're not doing this. Oh, it's because you're not. How small is your God to think that the people are the ones that sustain the ministry? I love you all, but I don't do it for you. I do it for him. I'm sent, not for you, but for him. But I love you because I love him. But here's the problem. When you become my focus, I stop trying to please him. But when he's my focus, I can better help you please him. That's my role. That's the role of a leader in the church. That's the role of a witness. We're not supposed to go out and try to find out what makes the world attracted to Jesus. There are churches out there that have full-on board meetings. And you know what they do? They sit around in a room. How do we draw more people to the gospel? You ever heard that? How do we attract more of the world into our walls? What? No, 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 no. The witnesses go out. They proclaim what God did for them and those people come in and they hear from the fivefold ministry on how to live. <laughs> Does that mean that if you're not in fivefold ministry, you can't have a part to play? Not at all. The word of our testimony has power. What God's done in your life may help someone else in the body get through something that's hard. If you've experienced loss and you found Christ in it, and you found how to get through this, somebody new who's experienced loss will need what you have to say potentially to get through that. And if you've, if you've been a perpetual liar, and, you're, and you've gotten free of it, and somebody comes in and they're struggling with lying, having that mix helps that person get pulled up. But if you don't have powerful people helping powerful people, you're going to have liars tearing the church down rather than the church pulling liars up. And this is why the state of the church is the way it is today. So the Samaritan woman is a beautiful example of a witness. Jesus was the evangelist. And technically, there, there was no evangelism in that day because the fivefold ministry hadn't been established yet. That didn't happen until Acts. But Jesus effectively walked in all of them. He's the Messiah. He can do everything all at the same time, and it's beyond our comprehension. But what they did is because no other man can do that, they established the fivefold ministry to govern and equip and train the church in the way that they should walk. Does that mean that someone in fivefold ministry has more God than those who are not? No. 
but we have greater accountability. And sometimes that with greater accountability also is paired greater authority. This weekend, I've recently had to exercise that authority. It's the first time I've ever had to publicly call someone out for their sin. But it's because that sin was being publicly announced. And if we as the church don't start acting like the church, the world will do a better job of drawing people in than we will. Because they don't have the boundaries the law of God restricting them. They can have all the benefits of the world without the restrictions, whereas the church says, come on in. God loves you no matter what, but you still kind of have to do these rules, kind of, sort of, not really, but you know what? God's grace covers you, so we're not going to talk about it. That's not witness. Oh, my word. We need to move faster. Okay, the woman witnessed, Jesus taught, some believed because of the witness, more believed because of Jesus. We need to remember this. If you're not called to an evangelist, you need to remember that you're still valuable to the kingdom of God as a witness. And if you are a Christian, you're supposed to witness, and we'll get to that. But next, I want to go to the next version of a, the next really good example of a witness, okay? We're going to go to Mark 5, and then we're going to go chapter 1 through 20. So if you've got your Bible, let's go over to Mark 5. We're going to talk about another witness. A man this time. I want, I want, you, to, I want you to see this. This witness is a man wanted to follow Jesus. Jesus said no. Those that followed Jesus often ended up becoming people of authority. Jesus looked at this man and said, no, I've got something different planned for you. Are you willing to serve God if he doesn't have you where you think you should be? What if God didn't call you to ministry in full time? Maybe he called you to start a business. Maybe he called you to work and serve a business. Maybe he called you to be in government. Maybe he called you to do these things because God sees what we don't see. But if we think we're supposed to be up here and God's like, no, 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 let's bump you down a few levels because your pride is putting you in some place you shouldn't be in. What's going to happen? You know, I, I get passionate about this because I've seen this hurt so many people. I've sat down with people on church boards who, who they're the board member comes to me, well, I didn't like that pastor, so we created this thing and got rid of him. I looked at him and said, well, that's not good. I said, I actually think church boards are demonic. He just looked at me. I said, since when do you have more authority than the one anointed by God to do the work of God? He just looked at me again. You see, the authority in the church doesn't come from board members. It comes from what? The one God called to be the apostle, the prophet, pastor, evangelist, teacher. The ones who are called to equip the saints. They're the authority. But you know why this is, and you, here's the problem. We have been so hurt by people in authority that we've decided to remove authority completely. Pastors have been so abusive that we no longer want to give them authority. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, prophets especially, have been so abusive in this culture that you know what we do is we get rid of it completely because I don't want to expose myself to hurt again. That's like throwing marriage out the window because you had a bad husband at one point or a bad wife. You can't do that. Marriage isn't wrong. That person in that situation was wrong. God still ordained and called leadership. And so when it comes to witnessing and outreach, there needs to be a certain order. And we like to think, well, who's going to hold the pastor accountable? Let me make you a promise that will put your mind at ease. If a pastor starts leading people astray, you don't need to worry about it because God's going to judge him. And it says it would be better that this person has a rope wrapped around their neck and tossed into the sea than he had ever done what he did. So don't you worry for a moment what's going to happen to those people because God will judge them. What we do is say, wait a minute. I've got the wisdom to recognize that pastor is not really saying the right things. You need to come and find somewhere that you can learn the right truth. 
You don't get offensive. You don't pick a fight with that pastor. Why? Because God put elders in place to do that. That's my job. That's the job of other pastors. We come together. The amount of pastors I've sat down with and had great conversations with is amazing because I have the authority to do that as an elder. But not everybody has that authority. You can approach a pastor, and the Bible talks about how to do that. But you know how they do that? You approach them. You say something. If they reject you, then you go and you grab the elders of the church to come in and have a conversation with them. Why? Because God believes in authority. And if they still don't change, the elders will move them out. But you see, we've, we've forgot authority. And so because we forgot authority, we don't understand outreach. And because we don't understand outreach, we try doing outreach in a way that doesn't actually produce fruit. And you get all these people coming into what they think is the kingdom of God. And then they hear that God wants them to change. And they say, well, no, he doesn't. That's not what I heard when I first came into the kingdom. And so these people that came into the kingdom and were a check mark on someone's box are now leaving the church because they didn't have an understanding of the cost of serving God. You see, Jesus taught them. She witnessed. Let's, keep, let's read over here. We're going to look at the second witness. Mark 5, 1 through 20. <laughs> they came to the other side of the sea, into the region of uh, <laughs> Gerasenes. And when he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. He lived among the tombs, and no one was able to bind him anymore, not even with a chain. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been broken, torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. So this guy was demon-possessed and possessed supernatural powers that not even chains could hold him. I mean, the, in, in, to, in today's Christian world, we like to think, oh, I like to go cast out demons, I like to do all these things. Here's what happens. If you're not ready or have the authority to do that, they are very, very strong. There is a supernatural anointing from the demonic realm that can fall on people. And if you're not exercising your authority on behalf of God, you won't have the ability to do so either. I want you to remember that during this time, Rome was the authority here and nobody could subdue this man. <laughs> that says something. And yet Jesus knew. Continually, verse 5, continually, day and night, he was screaming among the tombs in the mountains and cutting himself with stones. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed before him and shouting with a loud voice, he said, What business do you have with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you to God, do not torment me. You see, when I first read this, I thought he was mocking, but I want you to see something. These demons had reverence for God. They saw him coming from a distance and they bowed. When I see this, I think of the end times when it says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. It's not just talking about man. The demons will bow because they know who Jesus is. They know who God is. And you know what I love about this is that God don't put me in hell. Let us go into the pigs and we'll drown the pigs. I feel bad for that pig farmer. What business do you have with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you, God, do not torment me. For he had already been saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, what is your name? Jesus asked the demons, what is your name? And he said to him, my name is Legion, for we are many. This man had multiple demons inside of him. <laughs> and Jesus is like, yeah, okay, come on out. And, and he begged him, who begged him? The demon begged Jesus earnestly not to send them out of the region, out of the region, if you read in Mark, it says, to the abyss. Now there was a large herd of pigs feeding nearby on the mountain, and the demons begged him, saying, send us into the pigs so that we may enter them. And Jesus gave them permission. And coming out, the unclean spirits entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, 2,000 pigs into the sea and drowned in the sea. That's a lot of money. Their herdsmen ran away and reported it in the city and in the countryside, and the people came to see what it was that had happened. And then they came to Jesus and saw the man who had been demon-possessed sitting down clothed and in his right mind, and the very man who had previously had the legion 
they came and they became frightened. They saw that this man was no longer bound by whatever was controlling him. And he began to beg him to leave the region. Jesus, you need to go. You're causing trouble. There's so much you can draw from this, but I, I, I want to point something out. The reason the pigs, one of the reasons I think the pigs died is because it showed that there was supernatural something what they may not have fully understood it on this man that was demon possessed and what came out of him entered the pigs and drowned the pigs and so everybody knows Jesus just cleaned up a mess and you know what they're saying no 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 I don't want you to be cleaning up any more messes here because it costs me something personally I don't know if you're drawing that connection but when people encounter the power of God, one of the biggest reasons we don't go after God is because when he starts cleaning, it starts costing. <laughs> when he starts cleaning, it starts costing. This is, this is outreach. He's doing outreach. Well, Jeremiah, that's not very Christian of Jesus to kill all the pigs. Where's the kind? They would say that about him today. Well, Jesus, why didn't why did you cost that man the pigs? That's not very nice of you. You think they wouldn't say that about him? How, why, why would you do that, Jesus? Here's why. Jesus is more concerned about your eternity than your temporary wealth. Well, God, why aren't you making me rich? God's like, because you're going to hell. And I don't want you to. It's as simple as that. <laughs> Let's keep reading. Verse 18, And he was getting into the boat, and the man who had been demon-possessed was begging him that he might accompany him. So this man is now free comes to Jesus. I want to come with you. Let me follow you. Let me be with you. And what does Jesus say? And he did not let him. But he said to him, go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and now and how he had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him, for everyone was amazed. Now I want you to see something. This is witness. Jesus said, I, you can't follow me because your job isn't to follow me. Your job is to go and tell the world what I've done. How many of us would be offended if we said, Jesus, I want to follow you? There were so many Jesus called and said, come follow me. And this one wants to follow Jesus. And Jesus says, no, I need you to go do something else. How easy would it be to be offended at that? But what did this man do? <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm going to go. And he did. And he went out and he told everybody he could find what God did for him. What was he doing? Sowing a seed. Because they were looking for a Messiah. And a demon-possessed man that nobody could deal with was now dealt with. 2,000 pigs drowned in a, in a river. Nobody can deny the power of God when that happens. You might have been able to say, oh, you know what, he just got better. But you cannot deny 2,000 pigs drowning in the river. Jesus was more concerned about how people came to eternity than how people saw him temporarily. We need to shift our focus as witnesses from being far less concerned what people think about us when we're, when we're moving with God and far more concerned about the hope that they might receive Christ and be changed forever. Jesus did a miracle and the man became a witness. You being here today is a miracle. Are you going to be a witness? 
Now, a witness, you don't have to have everything perfect. You can go out and say, look what God did for me. Come in here t- teaching on this. That's exactly what these witnesses did. You see, what do churches do? We go out and say, you need to go out, and I've been in a church that guilt-tripped me for not doing this. You're not going out and telling people about Jesus. You're not telling them that they need Jesus to be saved. Why aren't you doing this? What's wrong with you? You don't love Jesus if you're not telling everybody that you need to do this. Wait a minute. All you need to do is this is where I came from. Unless God's given you the ability to speak, then you can share some of the word. Then you can share what you've learned. But a witness, what's most powerful is that you're not so unique. No one else has experienced what you've gone through. Okay, I, I had the, a pe- preacher tell me this once. He's like, Jeremiah, you're not special enough that Satan only picks on you. <laughs> yeah, you're right. What I've gone through, everybody else has gone through. Why? Because Satan hates all of us equally. He's not prejudiced. So what is a witness? We're going to go through some points here. It's, it's important. So number one, a witness has to have heard or seen. Okay? If you're going to be a witness of God, you have to have heard or seen. How can you witness if you didn't see it? Now, it, it, <laughs> so many of us, well, I've, witness, I've witnessed the power of God. I saw him do this. Did you? Or are you just saying that because you know it's going to draw people to you? I seen it. I, Facebook is a really prime example of this, but this happened outside of Facebook. But you see people all the time who are like, oh, this happened and this happened in my sob story. Oh, da, 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 da. But God delivered me. And they get all these people who are like, oh, you poor thing. I'm so glad God came through to you. Amen. Way to go. And then you find out later he was lying about the whole thing. He's bearing false witness. In order to witness, you have to have heard and or seen and so when you're witnessing don't make up stories god doesn't need your lies god needs your truth talk about what god did in you and so often we think well what god did in me is is so small look at me i grew up in a christian home i'm not one of those todd whites that was in the middle of a gang and god delivered him from that i grew up in a christian home but that doesn't mean i didn't struggle with the same demonic attacks that he did i just found jesus a lot sooner But Satan hates everybody equally. And it's important to remember that your testimony, while it may be small to you, it's no small thing that you're in Christ. Number one, a witness has has to have heard or seen. Number two, a witness believed and was changed. This wo- the woman at the well believed that Jesus was the Son of God and was changed by it. And that change is what was so attractive to, the, to everybody else she reached out to that they came to see what changed her. You see, people can go out and they can cry out whatever they want. And that happens a lot today. And you know what? We don't believe criers anymore because they do what they want to do to get attention. But when they see change all of a sudden your witness becomes more powerful. Same with the man who was, had the demons. He was demonically possessed. He was cutting himself. He was broken. He was bleeding. He was naked. He was disgusting. And he was changed. And he believed. This word believe, remember, it's not just, it's not just this, but, oh, I know that it's true. I live that it's true. Number three, a witness tells a testimony. A witness doesn't have to preach the gospel. A witness tells a testimony. Because oftentimes, brand new believers make the best witnesses though they know nothing about God's word. Why is that? Because God transformed them. And so their witness becomes their strength. How many, I I can't tell you how many young Christians I've seen get transformed by God, and they go out thinking they're evangelists because they're telling the world about Jesus. No, 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 no. You don't know enough about him to talk about him. Go out and tell your testimony and bring them to somebody more mature to walk them through it. Otherwise, that person will fall, and I've seen it over and over again. 
But it's because we as, as, as church leaders have said, you know what, go out and tell them about the gospel. Well, they don't know about the gospel. All they know is what God did for them. So be a witness. That's all you need to do. Until you've grown, until you've become mature, until you're walking in the way God wants you to, until you're spirit-filled, until you have so much of God on the inside of you that that's all that's coming out of you. And when you're there, now you can talk about God. Now you can teach. And, and oftentimes the Bible says you should be anointed into that position. Why? The anointing is the transfer of authority. That's what an anointing is. Look at Elijah and Elisha. It was a transfer of, an, of, of authority. Elijah had the authority to do a ton of miracles. What did Elisha ask for? I want to do ten times what he did. Or double, sorry, not ten. I want to do double what Elijah did. And so you know what? He anointed him, giving him the authority to do double. This is how God works. So a witness tells a testimony. Number four, a witness does not necessarily hold any authority. A witness does not necessarily hold any authority. While they can, because an evangelist can also be a witness, or a pastor can also be a witness, or somebody in the fivefold ministry, or an elder, or a deacon can also be a witness, but it's not required. You can be a witness and hold no authority in the church. And here's the beautiful part. You can be a witness that has better reach than somebody who claims to be an evangelist and has no anointing for it. I know men that would say, I'm an evangelist. And they treat their wives like garbage. And they have the character of snot. It's disgusting and sticky and, and nobody wants anything to do with it. And they say, I represent God. And they pull out their Bible and they read in the deep voice. And they say, I'm from God. I spent 20 hours studying for this five-minute sermon. If it takes you 20 hours to study for a sermon, you're not anointed. For five minutes, I'm sorry. Because it's out of the abundance of our heart that the mouth speaks. You don't even... I, I, I do in-depth studies and I take some time to do it because I want to find out and I want to show you in Scripture where these things are. But you could, you could take my Bible away. You could take my notebook away. You could put me in the street and say, Jeremiah, teach on something. And I could give you a thousand sermons. Why? Because they're inside. It's out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. I'm not saying that to be prideful, but I'm saying that Jesus said we're supposed to guard our hearts. We're supposed to have the law of God written on our hearts. We're supposed to have him being formed on the inside of us. Now, if he's on the inside of us, and I trust the Holy Spirit, and I have his word hidden away in my heart, when I go to teach, the Holy Spirit will bring Bible verse after Bible verse that's required for where I'm talking because I'm walking in obedience. But it doesn't mean you have to have authority to be a witness. Number five, we're all called to witness. We're all called. Look at what God did in me. Look at what he did when I submitted to him. One of the reasons the church makes such a poor witness nowadays is because we don't actually submit to him. You can't go to the world and say, look at what God did with my marriage, if you have a crappy marriage. You can't go to the world and say, I have peace now, if you have no peace. You can't go to the world and say, look, God turned my family around, if God hasn't turned your family around. A witness of God requires an encounter with God, whether that's with his word or with one of his people. Let's go to Matthew 5, verses 13 and 14 for a moment. Matthew 5, verses 13 and 14. I want, I want to, this is the being a witness part. It says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by people. 
Verse 14, you are a light of the world, a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. It, and it keeps going. But it says nobody can hide a light unless you first put it underneath a, underneath a, 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 a basket or whatever and hide it from the world. Now let me tell you something. Jesus, this is the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus wasn't just talking to the disciples at this point. Who was he talking to? The church. Everybody who was gathered. Everybody who was listening. You're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. How is that possible if we're not all in fivefold ministry? We're all called to be a witness to what Christ did. But a, a witness who no longer shines his light is of no value. And a witness who is no longer salty is trampled underfoot. These are Jesus' words. You see, the reason we suck at witnessing, and I'm not necessarily talking about just here, but in the church, the reason so many suck at witnessing and won't do it is because they're not proud of what God's done in their heart because God hasn't done much in their heart. You look at the people who are on fire for God, they're probably reading, praying, studying, spending time with God, and God's moving. They're walking in obedience, and God's responding, and you're watching things happen in their life to the point where they, can't not, they cannot stop talking about what God's doing because what God's doing is good. If you are a Christian, you're called to be a witness. Light and salt. Now I'm going to end with, these, with this last page, and I'm going to try to go through it as quickly as possible. It's important, though, here's the flip side of it. It's important, though, not to bear false witness. Okay, let's go to Proverbs, uh, I think that's 19, 19.5. Sorry, Kyle. I think you got it. You did. Oh, good man. A false witness will not go unpunished, and he who tells lies will not escape. A false witness will say that which is not true for personal gain, and sometimes even often about God. They'll talk about what God did for them, though God did nothing for them. They'll talk about how God transformed their lives, though they're not transformed. They'll talk about the things, and, and you see this today. Well, I, I'm a homosexual, and God did all this stuff for me, and I'm a pastor. No, he didn't. God's not doing nothing to you except judging you because of your sin. And you need to repent. And if you don't repent, God's going to judge you. Because God does things according to his word. That's his promise. And if you're stepping outside of his word intentionally with sin, you're not going to receive anything except a confident expectation of a boot in the rear towards hell. That's what scripture says in Hebrews. Do not bear false witness. Mark 10, 19. You know the commandment. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not what? Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Do not bear false witness is among the things God takes so seriously. Now, I'm not just talking about bearing false witness in according with God, but bearing a witness means you've seen something, and if you're a false witness, you're lying about what you've seen. Or you're lying that you've seen it. Here's, here's another example of a false witness. A false witness experiences what God said. Oh God, you transformed my life. You did this, you did this. And somebody says, how did you get your life in order? And you say, I don't know because you're scared to share the truth. You're a false witness. You know the truth. Jesus said, if, you, if you, somebody knocks on your door and asks you for a loaf of bread, why would you not give it to them? Proverbs says, if somebody comes to your door asking you for help, do not turn them away and tell them that you will give it to them later. Give it to them now. We're not, if we become false witnesses, we start teaching people the ways of Satan rather than the ways of God because Satan is the father of lies. So many are false witnesses in the church in an attempt to keep peace or make someone feel better. We do it to fill our churches and we change the gospel to make it palatable. This is bearing false witness. When you change what God said in order that others might be able to swallow it, you're changing the gospel. You're, you're saying, what well, God's word isn't good enough, so I need to adjust it a little bit so that somebody might want it. Here's the thing is if you don't want a God who died for you, even though he has expectations, don't come to God. That doesn't make him less real. 
but I will never bear false witness of him. Because when I do that, I'm lying about the one who set me free. We, I, have a, I have a point for this. We speak of love, but our hearts are self-centered, lawless, and hypocritical. This is the state of, of a lot of the church today. This is why, and, and you think it's any different. Paul wrote the letters. If you look through the entire New Testament, whether it was, whether it was Peter, whether it was James, whether it was Paul, or whoever, or John, they're all, here's a little bit of encouragement, but you're going off. Let me bring you back. They're all, in, they're all correction. They're all real proof. Why? Because what did they want? It wasn't because they wanted to dominate. It's not because they wanted to be, ooh, look at me, I'm holier than thou, which is what a lot of the church is accused of today. It was because they wanted those people to experience what they have. A deep, intimate, knowledgeable relationship with God that has no lawlessness or selfishness present. When we're bearing witness, we need to remember that when we change this, don't go, in and, don't go and embellish your story. Tell it like it happened. If it's a dirty story, tell it like it happened. Well, I was in sin and God rescued me from it. Somebody came in and told me about the gospel and I repented of my sin and it's gone. That's a good story. Don't let somebody tell you otherwise. We were at at, at a church once, and I asked my wife, because we were youth pastors, I asked my wife to come in and talk about, because uh, she had shared with me, there was a struggle with pornography. And so we shared about, about some stuff in that and, and, and how to get through this kind of stuff. And you know what happened is the pastor came to me, said, you can't talk about that stuff here. You made some people offended. I looked at him and I said, well, if you want me to be a youth pastor, that's not changing. I was a little bit of a stubborn fella looking back. But, but, what, but when you start to talk about your testimony, there's nothing off limits if God tells you to share it. Because I came from here to here. And you do not get to tell me that testimony is invalid because somebody feels uncomfortable with my old sin. God knew where you were. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You can't tell me he was ashamed of my sin. He died for it. And somebody needs to hear how you get through sin. I was taught that as a pastor, you cannot expose yourself. You cannot show that you have weakness. You have to look perfect to everybody. This was the mentor I had for a while. And I said, look, if I'm struggling and my church knows about it, who cares? So I look human. It's better you see me struggle and rise than know I've never struggled and continue to. Because now you can follow my example out of sin rather than thinking I've never sinned. This is a, this is a witness. Look at what God did. Look at what he's doing. Look at what he's done. We have to make sure that every single thing we do is not focused inwardly if we want to be a witness. If you witness a crime and, and the police call you down to the police station and you give an account of what you saw, is it about you? No, what are you doing? You're witnessing the truth so that the one who committed no crime doesn't get punished. And the one who did commit the crime is held accountable to the authority. And yet, for some reason, as Christians, we bear false witness for personal gain. And we think it's fine. But witnessing isn't about me. It's about him. And what he did in me. Let's go to John 8.44. You are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. If you are a false witness, you are Satan's child. This isn't me speaking. All I did was quote scripture to you. 
This is how God sees it. Well, God's not black and white. Actually, God's white, Satan's black, and he knows the difference. <laughs> God cares about us. God cares about our holiness. He cares about our witness. He wants us to be good witnesses. God doesn't want you to go out and flounder. He wants you to go out in strength, in knowledge, in understanding, in hope, full of hope, full of joy, full of peace, knowing who your God is so that nobody can come against you. Here's what a witness does not always do. They do not go out and teach the gospel always. Not everyone's called to teach the gospel. Most are called to live the gospel. And you share from the wisdom God gives you when he leads you to do it. Because, because so many people try to teach the gospel, there's so many different variations of the gospel. And because there's so many different variations of the gospel, nobody knows what's real anymore. Nobody's accountable. The amount of times I've had somebody look at me and say, Jeremiah, that's just your opinion. No, it's scripture. God doesn't care about my opinion. He doesn't care about your opinion. He gave his opinion. <laughs> That's all that matters. And so when we live, it should be in such a way that says, I'm going to submit to this over everything else. And you know what? There's been times where even as an elder and a pastor in the church, I've said things and had to come back a week later and correct what I said. If you go back and find the YouTube, you'll find that that's happened. Because you know what? We're all human. I've made mistakes. But you know what I've done is I try to lead in such a way that said, yeah, I made a mistake. And I publicly cleaned it up. Just like I publicly made it. This is acceptable to God. It's what Peter and Paul did. Paul came to Peter and said, wait a minute. You said this and now you're doing this. What's the problem? You're being a hypocrite. So what did Peter do? He repented. He stopped doing it and he went back. You know what? God honored both of them. Paul for saying something. Peter for repenting. This is the body. And you know what happened? It's beautiful when it works together because both got stronger. Both glorified God. Isn't that what we want? That's what a witness does. I'm a citizen. I'm a king's kid. That's what I do. If you're going to be a witness, you need to be a good witness. Let's go to Matthew 5.37, and this is where we'll end. But let your statement be yes and yes, or no and no. Anything beyond these is evil. When you say something, let it be that what you say is true. When you commit to something, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. When you commit to God, let it be yes, sir, I'm following you, or no, sir, I won't. There's no in between. There's yes and there's no. Swearing on something, pretending that something is real, making, doing all of these other things. What does it say about it? Evil. You, you, you mean to tell me the gray zone is... Yeah, gray is evil. You're either in Christ or you're everything else. Which one do we choose to be? As a witness, we're to go out and tell the world what Christ did in me, in you. And do so with absolute humility. Not so that the world looks at you and says, look at how cool you are. But so that the world looks at you and says, I want to know the God you serve. Amen. Thank you, God, for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord God, that as we continue to serve and operate and walk with you, Father, Lord God, that you would, you would continue to show yourself faithful because you are. And Lord God, I just, on behalf of everybody here, Lord God, I, I say we repent of whatever we've done wrong. Wherever we've missed it, I ask that you would show it and reveal it to us, Lord God, so that we can cut that out of our life and that we can grow stronger in you. Father, let there be nothing found in us that's evil or, or wrong or hypocritical, Lord God, but let us be a people that shine bright and are good representatives of you. And let us be a people that are salty, Lord God, that when we, when we speak, we speak from a position of humility, knowing who you are. In Jesus' name, amen.